record, start recording this. I am going to see if I can set up this spotlight video. There we go. There you go. So now, uh, hopefully that doesn't freak you out, but that's, uh, <laughs> makes it easier for everybody to see you and you're the star, you know? Where? There's no star. We're all <laughs> in the boat together. All the accordion players in the world are in the same boat together. Well, let's see here. 603, who, how many people we got here right now? I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, we got enough to start, I think. Let me just get it going. I think we should just go for it. You know, I don't like to wait for too many people because then you just kind of, you might never start. So, um, so what's going on? Interview, and I just changed something. I'm trying to make you there okay you st you are still the spotlight video awesome um okay well 605 we're gonna get it and then let me just message dallas here we're gonna record the thing anyway and i know that you got stuff to do too so i don't want to keep you waiting man i know you got plenty of things to get into so um, all right, people, people that are listening out there, I see Alan, I see Lauren, I see Linton. Who else do I see real quick? Uh, I see Ron, Dallas, Kara, Zeldy. Hey, Zeldy. We got Dwayne Quenzel. Nice to see you again, Dwayne in the mix. Richard Cullen, Bill Sinner, Karen Lee. Hey, Karen. Karen's one of our board members. We got Jamie Mashler in the house, seated just across from me on the couch and Laura Jean Nyland. Um, I think we're going to start, guys. So allow me to introduce um, our guest today. Uh, I don't know if I need to, because I think just about everybody is aware of who Joey Miskelin is, but I'll just kind of read off some stuff here. And it's Miskelin, right? Is that the way? Okay, cool. Because I hear some people say it some funny ways. And Okay, Joey Miskelin's music has garnished audio and video recordings, movie tracks, live performances for a wide range of artists, including U2, uh, all the way to Roy Rogers. In addition, his company, Music Wagon, has produced multiple Grammy award-winning albums for Walt Disney Records, music for P Disney Pixar's Oscar-winning short animation for The Birds, and orchestrated many wide-reaching music projects. As a child in Chicago, Joey displayed early signs of musical prodigy, spontaneously showing an interest in the accordion by the time he was four, was performing professionally by age 11, and had his first recording produced by Roman Pacetti at 12. A year later, Joey met Frankie Yankovic, performing a, pers uh, performing a personal and professional relationship with the man known as America's Polka King that would last a lifetime. He toured with Yankovic and his featured accordionist, as his featured accordionist for years, and continued writing and arranging songs and producing Frank's recordings until Yankovic's death in 1998. In the 1990s, Joey rejoined Riders in the Sky and tours them today as Joey the Cow Polka King, in addition to ongoing producing, writing, and recording projects. just want to say thanks again, Joey, for uh, agreeing to do this interview and being uh, a part of the NACS programs here. This is the only the second interview we've had, so I feel wow. like to have you on here as our second one is just, it's a real treat. Well, um, I appreciate the opportunity, absolutely. So we got plenty of questions and stuff to talk about and we've already been chatting a little bit, but I think it'd be great to start us off with a tune if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Let's do one from, uh, from the album, uh, The Other Side of the Fence. Uh, as most of you people will, will realize, most of the stuff I do, uh, I don't have arrangements that are wrote. I'm an improvisational player. So every time I play it, I'll play it a little bit differently, except maybe for an intro or something. So here it goes. This one's called Avalon, similar to what's on the record. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. I know it feels like only I'm clapping, but everybody is, I'm sure. <laughs> wow. I love I that. A, I must tell everyone in case they don't know, um, in February, I had my hand rebuilt by uh, the head of orthopedics here in Nashville. Uh, it was a wonderful doctor at Vanderbilt University Hospital. So my, my hand at that point, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to play anymore. And uh, the only way I got through it was I told myself that I had been on the road and playing professionally for 55 years. And I decided that if I wasn't able to play, that it had been a great run. And I was thankful to everyone who came out to see me in all those years and listened to me. But fortunately, the doctor did a great job, and my hand is coming back. It's about maybe 70%. Uh, uh, I think the, the biggest thing that accordion players, uh, they, they get used to, that their hand has, my hand has a memory. It's the memory of my fingers and my hand positions, and that's what's sort of missing. Where I used to, years ago, if I wanted to play a, a, an F major 7, I, I can grab it like that. Sometimes, after I played a little bit, but when I pick up the accordion, it's not there. I have to get used to the keyboard. My hand, the memory is not what it was, but it's coming back. So I'm hoping that, as the doctor said, six to nine months from now, that I'll be back to where I was, I hope. So. You don't have any loss of sensation, though, right? You know, you still, everything is... Everything cool. is there. The pain is completely gone. Uh, the, what it is, it, it feels like my thumb, when it's here, is actually here. So uh, it, it's making me have to think when I play occasionally. And I, I haven't had to do that since I was probably maybe 50 years ago. After you play so much, it's just, it's a, it goes right from your brain to your heart or your heart to your brain to your muscles and it, and it happens. But I'm having to, to think about a position because I don't want to put myself in a jackpot where I'm going to grab something that I can't do yet. So Sure. Well, it sounds like it's working for sure, man. I, I don't think anybody would ever know. Yeah, um, know. Speaking of, you know, like I think accordion stuff, I mean technical stuff and, and just playing the accordion. We had a question from, um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask mine first and then I'm going to ask Rich in a second. I noticed, you know, Joey, you have such a, like a light and, and clean touch and your articulation on the accordion is just so, is so, um, like I said, it's very clean, it's very measured, and I'm just wondering, you know, can you describe how you get that sound and also how you practice and develop that? Because it's something that you don't hear a lot of accordion players do. It's a lot of this, you know, extra, extra. I mean, like a lot of very legato playing, but not just legato, that it's very kind of mushy, and, and I just think it's such a, um, a great thing to hear somebody like yourself play with such clean dexterity and great time and it's so light and, and enjoyable. Well, I thank you very much. I think the way I can explain what I, how I got to that point was very, very early on. I have to say, I, I stopped listening to accordion players with the exception of maybe five that were great heroes of mine. And I started listening to clarinet players to horn sections for phrasing, but especially for articulation. I listened to uh, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, uh, people like that. And also to get tone, uh, um, uh, what was the fellow that had Stranger on the Shore? Um, hmm, I can't think of the artist. But anyway, just this, this simple, you know. string sections too, horn sections and string sections. That, in a band uh, application, I think that the accordion takes place, especially in Riders in the Sky. Uh, I'm either playing string parts when I'm backing somebody or playing horn parts uh, when I'm not doing a solo. And those are a lot of stabs. If we're play, playing a solo take, but to my boots and saddle. Red River Valley. So that's, that's the main 
main thing I can say is really, I don't know, I have no formula because it was happening over the years as, as years went by. But all I can tell you folks is to, to listen. Listen to music, keep your ears wide open. Uh, listen to, to crazy things. Uh, listen to Manavani. Uh, listen to Tower of Power. Listen to everything, you know, and, and see what, what the groups are doing. And then, you know, Too Slim and Riders in the Sky says, you know, you've got an orchestra in a box. So I can do a lot of things with this that you couldn't do um, with a piano or an organ because it is a, a wind instrument. I always equate this uh, to be a wind instrument more than a keyboard instrument. You're, and I'll find a lot of times when I'm doing backing and I'm really getting into it, it's all sounding good and it's all working with a group that I'll be breathing along with my bellows, uh, you know, in or out. And, and that's where I got my style from listening to woodwinds and to brass. I think that was that was the main thing. Sometimes in Riders in the Sky, I almost it almost sounds like you do some things that remind me of a pedal steel too. It's like yeah, this. Well, sure, sure, you can get. It. feeling worse better within a band because I can make it sing a little bit better. Um, uh, when you're playing by yourself, you're the primary, you're the only instrument, so it doesn't work quite as well as you're playing with a group and you can kind of make it work. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, that's, a, that's actually something that I wanted to talk about as well. Um, I also wanted to ask you a little quick question about your accordion, because I know that you're a pan accordion guy. And mm -hmm. somebody told me that your pan accordion doesn't have a chamber. You don't play a chambered. Is that how it is? I've never played a recording session with a chambered instrument. And really funny, in talking to, uh, to um, um, Bill, um, oh gosh, at the accordion convention, um, Palmer Hughes. So it's Bill Palmer, who is a friend of mine, and his dad was uh, the wonderful William Palmer. And he said his dad never had a chambered accordion either. I, I just, I never liked uh, that sound with the exception of two guys. I, I, I like the sound that, that Van Damme got because he had one of the lows in the chamber. He had another set of lows that were out of the chamber. And it was just a really nice sound. And uh, also Contino. I like Dick's sound on his pitosis. You know, he had a chambered accordion. But myself, I don't. I, I just like the reeds to sing a little bit. I, I don't like that extra... Uh, extra volume and, and that sort of, uh, it's almost to me like using a, a compressor where it takes the sound and you just kind of, or a limiter and it just takes, makes it sound like this. Uh, sure. I just prefer a... <laughs> just one reed and it's so sweet. But the trick is you have to have handmade reeds which are difficult if not impossible to get today. Uh, Expensive too. I have, I, I have uh, 16 pan accordions, all like this. I just picked this one up because I hadn't played it for a while. All of them have double riveted handmade reeds um, and they are absolutely incredible. Uh, and you can only get the sounds I want uh, without, a without a tone chamber when you're using handmade reeds. It's, it's sure. as simple as that. It's got to be quality. Do you play mostly on clarinet? Um, I mean, it sounds like I, just judging by the stuff I've heard with writers, that you know you don't hang too low, um, and you get a pretty single reed sound. I know you play some other stuff too, but is that w what you find works best with a group like that? Yeah, writers. There's basically two two uh, stops that I use. One it would be bassoon. <laughs> to use the high because uh, again it's the string thing you know excellent solo, solo a lot of times I, i'll use uh, two middle re the, all, uh, by the way none of the accordions that i record with that piccolos at all it's three middles and a low i do have a, a, an accordion i shouldn't say uh, none of the accordions I record with. Very few recordings that I've done uh, have an accordion with piccolo reeds. Uh, I like I like the 
robustness. I like the, the, the uh, way I can uh, make it work with three middles and a low, uh, even though I'm not maybe using all of them uh, when, I, when they're called out. But here's about as, as, as uh, wet as, as one of my pans is, just about like this. Not very wet. This no. Here's two reeds. Here's two reeds. He's not a master. But I like a more precise, punchy sound, uh, or sweet. Uh, but when I want the punch, I want it to be there. You know. Cool. Um. I definitely have plenty of other stuff I'd love to chat with you about. Would you mind playing like another tune for us? Just a mm -hmm. buddy. Yeah, let's do, uh, let's see something completely different. Let's do uh, uh, Petite Waltz. to grab a chord, but that happens now. As a matter of fact, there was a, a concert I was going to do in October that I've canceled. I, I can play with the writers, I can do things, but I didn't think that uh, it would be fair to the people to give them a, a concert with my hand, because, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope that they don't have to think about what I'm doing, they can just enjoy the music, and that's what I want to do when I'm up there playing. I just want to play the music and not think about what I have to do. So, uh, sure. yeah. Oh man, um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about like um, kind of how you came up a, as an accordionist with Frankie and, and also maybe some things that you might um, recommend for, for younger people trying to, to make it to, you know, like people that want to play like myself, like a lot of um, people in the, in the knack that are looking to figure out, you know, that really want to play, that love the instrument and, yeah. and how did you first meet um, Frankie Yankovic? Well, let me just give you a little a prequel to that. When I was uh, young, my dad had come back from World War II with a, a small 12 bass accordion that he got in Sicily. He was in Sicily in, in some of the, the bloodiest fighting there was in the war. And uh, he brought an accordion back thinking that at least he would get something that he went He fooled around a little bit with the accordion, the little 12 bass. Anyway, uh, Time goes by, it's 1949, I am born, and then four years later, it's, it's 1953, and I would see that instrument in the corner and, and always wanted to play it, but was afraid to. And I see my dad, my dad, this was about the way he played accordion, and he played this song too, I told Coutinho. <laughs> this was a song that got me interested in the accordion, my dad would go. <laughs> must have thought I can't remember exactly but I picked up the instrument and started imitating him just being a parrot to what he would do and uh, my my dad mom said 
would you like to take lessons and learn how to play it? And I said, yeah. So my grandfather and grandmother on my mom's side came from Slovenia, which was uh, really when they came over, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire before it became Yugoslavia. And uh, Slovenia, if you look on the map, butts right up against uh, Italy on one side and then Austria on the other side, Croatia on the other side. Uh, so it is a Tyrolean country. Uh, and uh, my dad's parents came from Croatia. So it was very close. It was like uh, Canada and the United States, just that, that close. And so uh, I, I always, as a kid, loved to listen to my grandparents sing the songs from, from Slovenia or when I went over to my dad's uh, parents' house, I would hear them sing Croatian songs. So there was always a lot of music. My dad, as I said, was a, he was a, sort of a, a, not a good musician, but he played for his own enjoyment. He played an instrument that he and his brother, Louis, made. Uh, it's, it's a Croatian instrument called a tamborica. They, um, they have string bands in Croatia. They're very close to mandolins. Uh, you have a small preem that plays lead. You have a bugaria. You have a brach. You have a big bass. You have a cello instrument. But, but it, they're all guitar-like instruments with the exception of the bass. It's called a cello because you play cello lines, but it's really a guitar-like instrument. All too very weird uh, and, uh, and and non-traditionally. Anyway, so I always had music around me. So I decided, of course, that I wanted to take lessons, and I did. And then when I got into like fifth grade, I guess it was, or could have been even fourth grade. Ah, it had to be. Yeah, it was fifth grade. I decided that the accordion was not very cool, and I wanted to play trumpet, and so I put the accordion down and picked up trumpet and played it in the school band. And all this was all great. My mom and dad, in the meantime, had gotten divorced. Uh, and when I was about uh, oh, 11, maybe just about 11, I got, my mom got a call from uh, the people they were having a shop picnic. She worked for Argo Cornstarch. They were the people that made Mazzola oil, Skippy peanut butter, and Argo Cornstarch, of course, and uh, a lot of other things. And uh, they said, well, does your son still have the accordion? By now, by the way, I had, my mom had bought me a really nice baby grand accordion that was made by Crown. And it was a good accordion. It still, it still really played wonderfully. And, and uh, I, I often say that if a kid doesn't have a good accordion, an accordion that responds the way he wants it to, he'll never become a good player. He needs a great accordion that, that sounds good to him. And it, I still have that box today. Anyway, I did go to play at the picnic. And when it was all over, I had eaten barbecue chicken, I had had potato chips, I had had Coca-Cola all day long, played the few songs that I knew on the accordion, and at the end they gave me 12 bucks. And I thought, wait a minute, what am I screwing around with the trumpet for? This is the way to go, I can make money playing my accordion. So I decided at that point to really start to practice you know, really, really, uh, and put my mind to it. So I then started taking lessons once again for about six months on the accordion, and it just clicked. Everything clicked, and I understood what the teacher was telling me, and I stopped lessons at that point and started to listen to things on my own, and I had a really good ear. Uh, it, thank, God, thank goodness, I, uh, I still do, where I could hear a song and then play it. Uh, not like I can now, but I could at least pick it out. It, in songs like... Uh, uh, <laughs> that when I was 11 years old. When I got pretty good when I was 12, I used to go in, my mom and grandmother would take me to a, a place called Jack and Blanche's. There was a polka band there, and I would sit in and play with them, and they thought, like any kid who's halfway good when he's that age, that it was really, really great. Uh, I was average, but but at least I was enthusiastic and playing all the right notes. So Roland Pesetti saw me and, and hired me, uh, and uh, by that time, if anyone was familiar with the Frank Yankovic band, he was like the hero of all the Slovenians. He had had a couple million selling records. He had just because of the Blue Star Waltz. And he always had two accordions after he had gotten really popular. Johnny Pecan, who was probably the greatest Slovenian accordion player uh, and technician, was, uh, was in his band. And if you played a song uh, with Yankovic, uh, there were five guys in the band. It was bass, banjo, piano, and two accordions. It was set up primarily like a Dixieland band, where Frank would play lead accordion, 
much like a trumpet would play the lead. So Frank would go. <laughs> now I would do, whoever was playing phil accordion would play, they call it phil accordion, or second accordion, but really it was phil. So if you can imagine that same song, let's put me I can sing a little bit better. So, so I would be doing this while he was doing that. Uh, just because you think you're so pretty, just because you think you're so So you kind of film like a clarinet would play in a Dixieland band. You're just wafting around the melody. And so I was attracted to that, and I was able to do it very, very well for my age. And so Frank hired me, the, the first year he hired me was uh, 1962. It was, uh, it was uh, Easter Sunday of 1962. And Frank, of course, uh, played all over the, the country, all over the world. And uh, so I had started sitting in with him when he came to the Chicago area, which was my home at that time. And uh, the day came where he said, look, I'd like you to, to be in the band and uh, play. And I went, sure, because when you're a 13 year old kid, you've got guts. You don't think about, you know, you don't worry about, oh my gosh, am I going to be good? Yeah, I'd love to do that. It's great. Let's do it. So I played my first job on Easter Sunday with Frank and it worked. It worked very, very well. The guys in the band who were much older than me and were great musicians. Frank at that time had wonderful musicians. Uh, Pete Rogan played with the Pittsburgh Symphony. He was, he was a wonderful bass player. Uh, the guitar player was great. You know, the piano player was wonderful. So it was a chance once he hired me to learn every single day and to implement these things. I, I would hear something that these guys would do, would do on the job and I would go home to the hotel room or, or home if I was back in Chicago and I would work on it. And the next day on the job, I would try it and see if it worked. And these guys were so open to, to helping me. I, I remember turning to the Chuck Davis who played, uh, he played steel guitar, but one of the greatest. And I recorded with so many here in Nashville. And I would say, Chuck, how do you voice it? You know, an augmented 11, or what do you do with the 13? Uh, and he would spell out the notes for me. I would say, Pete, you know, what, you know, what, what how would you make, what's your landing chord if you're starting with an A minor seven? And you want to move the G. How would you make this? I would spell out the notes. He would say, Step. If you want to make a little dissonant, you'd have a B, a C, an E, a G, and B on top. And I would try this stuff. They were they were never reluctant. They were really good to me. And that's how I learned a lot of times. You know, when I started recording at Columbia with Frank, mm -hmm. I was only just about 14 years old. I was still 13. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, when you recorded at a studio like Columbia, you had to write out the arrangements mm -hmm. for the bass and for a chord chart for the producer to, to follow, you know. And Frank said, can you do that? And I said, well, sure I can. I, I had no idea, but I, I bought a college course book in the meantime before the recording session and taught myself how to do that. So uh, it, again, it was just blind uh, stupidity as a kid that said, sure, I can do it all. And fortunately, it all worked out. It, you know, I applied myself and, and it did work out for me. That's excellent. Yeah, I just can't. Uh, it just sounds like you were really surrounding yourself with amazing oh, people. It was great. It was so, so great. You know, I, I always tell them, that's one of the things, if you're playing with a band, always try to play with people that are better than you. Don't play with people that aren't as good as you or even as good as you because there's nothing you can learn from them. You know, you might learn the texture of how to, how to play in a band, but when you're starting out, you know, for the first few years, you know, when you're starting to, to create a, this great thing in your mind of how you want to play any instrument, not only accordion, always work with people that are better than you. You learn so much from them, you know. Yeah. What do you, so in that kind of vein, you know, talking about getting brought up and being under somebody's wing and, all, you know, what are, what kind of advice would you give to like a young accordionist today? Somebody that, um, whether they're 15 or 25 or whatever, that are trying to um, play and, and do their thing, you know, what kind of advice might you give somebody like that? Well, I'll tell you, when we do symphony shows, there are symphony players who are absolutely magnificent. They're wonderful people who can, uh, can translate what is on the written page to the most beautiful sound there is. 
but if you ask them to just do a head arrangement or play something by ear, they can't do it. I think that everyone who has the ability to do something like that should really, should really exercise their mind uh, to the, so you can eventually just play things without, uh, oh God, I don't know how to explain it because I'm not, I'm not really a teacher, but so you can play things without trying to be analytical about them. Uh, you know, you should be able to, once again, go from your mind to your heart to your hand. So if you're playing a thing, uh, <laughs> I'm playing it, you know, and uh, it's not like trying to figure, well, what should I do there? Um, play things that you like. Make sure you have an instrument whose sound you like. Um, and just just try things. It doesn't have to be, it does not have to be uh, intricate when you're starting. Uh, I remember when I recorded with Shania Twain, the title uh, song in her first single from the album Come On Over, is in the middle of it, there's, a, uh, there's an accordion solo that I played. And uh, her piano player never played accordion. So on the first few jobs, and even on television, they would use part of the track. A lot of bands do this. They'll use the track in addition to live players. So it was me playing on the TV, thing, which is very nice when you get the checks, the royalty checks for that. Oh, yeah. but, uh, but eventually, the piano player had to get an accordion and had to learn how to play that stuff. You know, and. Uh, because when I came to Nashville 30 years ago, really the only accordion player of consequence back then who, who, who I knew of was Vic Willis, who played on the Grand Ole Opry and had the Willis Brothers Trio. There was another fine accordion player in Nashville. His name was Mike Zikovich. He was not even listed in the union book back then under accordion. Uh, there, there's a stigma, which everybody may know about accordions, and a lot of people subscribe to the stigma, and they shouldn't. I never did, you know. You don't like the instrument, well, listen to me play it, and, and then if you don't like it, well, then it's me. It's not the instrument that you don't like. And uh, Mike was uh, playing keyboards, playing organ and piano, and an excellent musician. But when I came to town, uh, Jack Clement and Steve Popovich were the ones who told me I should move here, and I had already produced the Grammy uh, up north with, for Yankovic. And, uh, and I did, and I started working amazingly. Uh, I, I was getting so many jobs, uh, that's why I told my wife, I said, look, let me go down there and commute for a, a year. Uh, let's buy a house in Nashville, we'll keep our house in Ohio. I'll go back and forth as much as I can, and after a year, if it's as good as it is now, then we'll move. And uh, it was, when I moved down here, I think I had appeared on like 125 albums when I moved here in 1980s. Late '86, early '87. Now I, I stopped counting the albums that I appear on at over 400. I just who, who knows, you know, it just got too crazy. But uh, it was just wonderful, and uh, all I remember the early sessions when I came to do uh, sessions for Jack Lennon. I remember walking up the stairs. He had his studio on the second floor of his home, and some of the musicians that he had uh, always used to. Kenny Malone, Roy Husky, Charles Cochran, uh, and, and others. Uh, as I was walking up the stairs, they were in Jack's office, and I heard, now let's count one guy, an accordion, you know, until we got up there and we did the first cut. And then it was like, wow, man, that's really great. Boy, that's nice. I like it. You know, let, let's do a second cut. So you can make people, you can, you can convince people that the instrument is very, very wonderful if you play it in a wonderful way. You know, if somebody's just like a guitar player playing hillbilly music, if, if it's, you know, if it's Chet Atkins, who is a great friend playing it, it sounds one way. If a guy's playing, you know, it's like an accordion, you know. Yeah. It's just not very pleasing. But again, on the other side of the coin, I applaud the person who picks up an accordion and plays it that way if it's making them happy. Music, we call it playing music because that's what we're doing. We're playing, we're not working uh, music. It's called playing music. But I don't know, I, I just, uh, I seem to, uh, to think that if you, you play the instrument in a great way, that people will enjoy it and they'll, they'll use you, you know. 
I dig it. Speaking of playing, you mind giving yeah. us another tune? Sure. How about, no, no, no. <laughs> How about, about uh... My hand is, you can hear why it's bothering me. Anyway, I'm doing my best at this point. Oh, it's fantastic. I'll be, I'll be back to where I was in six months. That was fantastic. I love the September song. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, into yeah. the, into yeah. the autumn leaves, of course, yeah. 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 Fantastic. I love it. Um, what I'm going to do, hang on, don't go away. I'm going to grab a, a different accordion here and show you the difference in style. Hang on. Bonus. I'm going. I'll be right back. I'm still here. What a bonus. I think that we're all just in for like the biggest treat right now. This is fantastic. Karen, I don't, I don't think he polished it. I think, uh, I think he, I think it's brand new. He just picked it up. Whoa, here we go. All right, so this is how to, uh, this is fashioned after a diatonic German Slovenian accordion. So the way you play it, and there's only one, there's no switches on it, there's only one. This is basically folk music, although I have used it on sessions with Steve Warner and uh, and some other uh, fine, fine musicians, but not using the helicon basses. So just use the, the right hand. But anyway, this is what this thing is uh, uh, meant for. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. And it's just a different way of playing, you know. Uh, I have another accordion uh, that uh, it's not here, it's in the studio, but it's for, for Cajun music. It's tune Cajun. Uh, it, it's really difficult to play a style if you haven't got an instrument that lends its sound to that style, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's why I've got various various instruments. I've got all the pans that I use because I love them. They're, they're, they're my favorites. I've played them for, gosh, going on 56 years now. Uh, but I also have Excelsiors. I have Italo Americans. This was made for me by Alphonse Baldoni, who since passed away in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, what else do I have? Um, uh, oh, others, others. I've got my my uh, my uh, Crown accordion that I I played uh, as a youngster. I got that was my first brand new accordion, and I got that like I said when I was about seven years old, and uh, it's still a <laughs> fine accordion. So, well, uh, we have. Have I'm Go sorry, ahead. we had a question come in about your uh, the reconfiguration on that particular box. So I know it's which is yeah, but what is it? What is it tuned like? What are we looking at? Three middles tuned slightly different. There's no way to get around it. That's the only sound you have. So there's three middles. So it's it's German or Austrian or or uh, Slovenian tuning for a. Uh, I also play, and I don't have it here, I also play what they call a half chromatic. I don't know how many people out there are familiar with what a button box looks like. It looks just like a button box, a small form of this with, with, with three rows of buttons on this side and only 12 bass notes. Mm -hmm. It's called a half chromatic because it's an instrument that was, that was invented in Slovenia. It's a half chromatic because this side is all chromatic. Same sound in and out with each button, right? Just a typical B system chromatic accordion. This side is diatonic. So you've got 12 buttons, you have six basses and six chords one way. When you pull the other way, you have the other six basses and six chords. So that's the way to get, you have no minors, you just have major chords. Uh, it's the way that you've got. All 12 keys that you can play. Uh, so it's a little bit weird to play unless you've grown up with it because this side, as I said, is the same in and out. So this, if you're playing, for example, just to show you, you have to go. So in or out, or depending on how you want to play. So that's, that's oh, yeah. So two read or three read, just middle read accordions too. So they sound like this. If not a little brighter, uh, the mine is made, oh, I had one that was made in 1934. And the one I have now was made by a very good friend of mine who passed away a few years ago and, and the Don Krantz from, from uh, Cleveland. And uh, they're just not made. I mean, there's not many people, there's only a handful of people in the whole world that still play this because most people would just graduate to a full chromatic where you could, just have buttons, you know, a B system or C system, and then just for basses. So uh, it, it's cool to play that. It's like a, an homage, you know, tip of the hat to, uh, to my ancestors, you know. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, this reminds me of the stuff I was listening to in Leavenworth. Heard a lot of button box players there, and uh, I heard a tune right. that I hadn't heard before from um, a young player, Cody McSherry, who played this tune called Slovenia. Oh, Slo yeah. Da -da 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 -da. One of the greatest proponents of Slovenian music ever. There were two people that made it heard all over the world. One was Frank Yankovic, who always, even when we went on a Johnny Carson show or Phil Donahue or any of the, the big television shows, he would always at least sing one song in Slovenian. Uh, he just always did that as a tip of the hat to his people. But the other one lived in, uh, he, as a matter of fact, he passed away about five years ago. His wife just passed this past year. And his name was Slavko Ausnik. And if anyone wants to hear the most beautiful melodies, it's a, it's a different sound than, than the polka stuff. Uh, his melodies are incredible. His, uh, the quintet, it was, uh, uh, it was, let's see, baritone, who also double on bass, guitar, trumpet, clarinet, and he played accordion. And then a lot of his music uh, was so beautiful that they did it in symphonies overseas. But yeah, your Slovenia is great. <laughs>
gorgeous. The melody is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, just incredible. The best. The best. I, I was I was privileged to know him, consider him a friend, and I've been to Slovenia, you know, times to many times to his museum and his he'll still love that they call, which is still there. It's uh, it's incredible. And his uh, grandson now has, has started uh, to, has continued the legacy. He has a band like his grandfather's. It's uh, the Osnick band as well. And his uh, uh, Slavko's other son, Gregor, is an incredible guitar player. So yeah, it just goes on and on. Wonderful music. We had a we had a question on the chat, and I want to just confirm how many accordions do you have, Joey? Oh God! Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I know how many pan accordions I have. Sixteen. And then, all right. So let's start there. Then let me try to, to figure. I have I have La Tosca that I'll travel with sometimes. I have the Crown. I have the Beltoni. I have two Excelsiors. I have two Italo Americans. I have the chromatic accordion. I have chromatic. So that's what 67, 18, 19, 21, 22, 23, 24. I don't know, 24, maybe more. Oh, I have a Lessman accordion organ uh, that that uh, I used back uh, with the Yankovic on a lot of the records. So I don't know, uh, le less than 30, but pretty close, I guess. <laughs> I keep one at the Grand Ole Opry. I keep uh, a number of them in Cleveland. I keep some of the West Coast. So if when I fly, I don't have to bring an accordion a lot of times. So they're they're scattered all over. Yeah. That's one way to get around uh, having to fly with your accordion. I tell you what, I'd like to do that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple more questions here. Um, and one of them is from Laura Jean Nyland, who's a uh, who's in attendance today, and um, it's an interesting question. What is the single most important innovative change that has influenced the accordion world? That could be a person or like a musical influence, a technology. Well, gosh. Well, number one, I think it's Fridella basses when they, when they came up with the, because Fridella basses, I also played other instruments, and uh, I think that the way Fridella basses are laid out are the thing that it's is the thing that uh, allowed me to become a, a good upright bass player because I, I mean it's a perfect system uh, I'm not talking about free basses that's something else but look one, one finger Stradella and to, to lay out the, the major, the minor, the seventh, and, and the, uh, the diminished, and even an 140 bass to have the augmented too is is wonderful. I think that probably, you know, years and years ago there were no piano accordions; it was all chromatic accordions in Europe. So I think that the, one of the biggest innovations was when they developed the piano accordion, so people who played piano could stroll with the band. Uh, I think that was huge. As far as players, oh God, you've got the Dero brothers, you've got Maniante, you've got my, my favorite jazz player of all time, and, and it was a dear friend of mine, Art Van Dam, but uh, Frank Morocco, oh uh, God, I mean, I could name the guys and never stop, Matt Matthews in Europe. Um, you know, but I think for the instrument itself, I think one of the good things was if people watch the Lawrence Welk Show now, they'll realize how many accordions Myron Florence sold. He was also a dear friend. He was on our radio show at the Radio Theater, and he was a friend of mine for years and years and years. But the exposure that he gave the accordion, Dick Contino, is the, I, I always say, Contino, and I told him this the first time I met him many years ago. I said, Dick, you played accordion like Gene Kelly danced. You know, there was Fred Astaire, who... I say it was like Mignante. Everything was perfect. He was a he was a perfectionist. Everything was great. But when Gene Kelly came out, it was like a an athlete. You know, he he danced, and it was also just great. But it was something that I could relate to. It was so so masculine and and good. You know, and the same thing with Contino. You know, you had. Uh, there it goes. <laughs> innovators and making you want to pick up the instrument, Contino, and Yankovic, and uh, 
you know, and, and Myron and all the rest back in the early days were in Maniati, Charles Nunzio was a good friend of mine. Uh, just, there were wonderful players. You know, a lot of people made lots of money playing accordion. I remember Charles Nunzio telling me that during the depression that he or, or Maniati or whoever would play the Staten Island Ferry and entertain the people as they were on Staten Island Ferry. And they would make much more money in the course of a week than the people that were working, you know, because even though they got maybe a nickel or a dime, they were on that ferry from morning till night playing their accordion and it was they made a fortune. You know? Not to mention later on when Maniati would be doing eight or nine uh, radio shows in, in the course of a week, maybe two or three a day, you know, it's nuts. That's amazing. I um, I was fortunate. I just got. I was at the shop today, the Potosa shop, and Dick Cantino's accordion's there. So I got I to play Cantino's accordion today, and it was just it sounded great. It was uh, it was like one of those special moments getting to connect that. Wasn't able to meet Dick, but I know he was supposed to be just a fantastic guy. Um, he was through, one, just a wonderful guy. Wonderful, so sweet, so soft spoken, and that's. I think that was a. What was so great is that he'd get on stage and he just, it was like he was driving a Ferrari on stage, but off stage he was just so sweet and so kind, you know, amazing guy. Uh, um, so I think we're, we're getting towards an hour, so we're kind of getting close. I don't want to like, I do have some more questions. You want to play another tune and then we'll kind of, sure. we'll, uh, keep, we'll keep sure. firing away. Lady be good, yeah. <laughs> Love that tune. You're playing all my favorite songs, man. Yeah, yeah. The I want to hear you play. I want to do when I get up to Seattle. I want to hear you play with the group. Let's do it, man. Yep. It'd be my pleasure. It would be a. It would be an honor, really. Don't know uh, wherever. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. I'm. I am always ready to play. Um. Uh. Somebody had a question about about your playing with the writers and I'm trying to find it here. And it was, um, what are the musical, we, we talked about this a little bit, but one of them was they asked, what do you do in your left hand when you're playing with the writers? And when I was watching you, it seemed like, you know, you don't all, you don't do a whole lot unless there's something that's really calling for you to be a big, big band section. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Or if I'm doing it like, uh, Sometimes I'm doing an intro to it. I may, I may do something. Or, or other things I like to do with, with it when the occasion arises is to, to do. Being sort so, of like stereo, you know? Yeah, so you're playing on like what? Like the middle high switch on your left hand side? Is that right? So I'd be going. Nice. I dig it. It's very cool. It almost reminds me sometimes of like piano players where they do like drop two voicings and stuff. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. 
Um, okie dokie. Um, you know, we got through, I think we kind of like did a lot of these questions, but I want to go through the chat and see if I'm missing anything here. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, you know, earlier you mentioned like the five accordion players that you, that you kept listening to. You mind uh, telling us who those are? No, I know. First of all, there was Art Van Dam, the greatest, absolute greatest. Then there was Yankovic I listened to. He, he Really, Yankovic's the guy that lit the fire under me when I was very, very small, when I was four or five years old, because my grandparents played his records all the time. And he was on TV, and it was someone I could relate to. So there was uh, Van Dam, there was Yankovic, there was Contino, who I enjoyed, but Yanti was another one that I loved. And uh, for the fifth one, I would have to say that, uh, oh, God. I just, I, I would have to say it was probably Johnny Pecan. Uh, Johnny Pecan, as I mentioned before, played. He's the guy that brought, just because to Frank Yankovic, Pecan had been in the South Pacific during World War II. He was in the Seabees, and he heard the song, and when Frank hired him to record in New York at Columbia, he's the guy that brought just because. And John played a, a chromatic accordion. He played a B system chromatic, and he was a, he was nuts. He was he couldn't read music at all, but his mind was uh, as incredible as, uh, as anybody. I mean, just like George Shearing, it was incredible. Then there was Leon Sash, who was a great jazz player in Chicago. I go on and on, but of those, of those, I would say they, they would be the five. Do you find most of the dudes in Slovenia, they all play B system, is that right? Well, yeah, oh yeah, for sure, because it's, it's the German system, so that's what was close. If you go across the border to Italy, they're all playing the C system, you know. Right. But, uh, but there has been a big, big resurgence. I remember the first time we went to Slovenia was uh, oh, probably in the early, early 80s. And at that time, you really couldn't find any folk music. If you wanted to, Yankovic and I led, along with the Calendar of Travel, Tony Pekosik, who was a DJ in, in Cleveland, led a tour to Slovenia with a number of people, you know, a couple hundred people. And he had to arrange uh, with a organization called Matica, which uh, is uh, something that preserves the, the folk music of Slovenia. And when these people came in, they were young kids that, that were taught the old songs and played the button boxes and stuff. And then for a while, it almost just went away. It was just rock and roll and jazz and, and stuff like that. But now there is such a resurgence of it. They have a, a, radio, a television station that's on 24 hours a day just doing folk music. And the good thing, what I love about it, is what I had hoped for the writers, too. They're really beautiful young girls, good-looking young guys that have these bands, and they're tremendous musicians. I mean, it's perfect music. Uh, it's, it's sweet, and generally it's, it's guitar, bass, or a baritone, and a clarinet, and a button box player who plays great. And the girls sing wonderfully, and, it, and this is a great resurgence of folk music, which I love. I'm going to go over the next year, as a matter of fact. I was there this past year. And did a uh, week's worth of jazz concerts. And uh, I'm going there next summer, not this summer, but next summer, to record an album, uh, a folk music album, to kind of, uh, my grandfather came from Slovenia in 1912, 1912 was before World War I. He came over, so I want to go back there to make, uh, who knows, uh, at my age it might be my final recording of folk music and folk music. So I want to do it with, with a great folk band. Oh, I'm sure you got plenty more recordings left in you, Joey. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Speaking about um, polka and Frankie Yankovic style music, I have a question from Rich Cullen. And he yeah. said, what are the best scales to practice to do second accordion on Frankie Yankovic style music? Something we talked about earlier, being a second accordion player. Is it, you know, major blues, pentatonic? Um, the first thing you want to do is to get speed and build up your speed. And to where your articulation is so good. So I always tell folks, get the hand and just start to do things like this. Let your fingers work. Don't, don't be using your hand. Let your fingers work. And do it so every note is... so much um it's uh 
oh god i don't know how, how to explain it just listen to dixieland music listen to what they're doing because you know like <laughs> notes within a chord. A good way to start is if the just to fill in the holes and, and just right. do something that's cool. And then start to, to bridge those so they go and just start to fill in all the other notes. It's a uh, you know, people have asked for years and years and years, why couldn't I do a second accordion book, a fill accordion book? Well, because I'd probably sell 10 copies. That's why it wouldn't be worth the effort. But if you listen to the records, as a matter of fact, in uh, Las Vegas this past summer of uh, last year, 2016, uh, there was a, a thing they call a concerto club where people come up with their instruments and they just play. They play two or three songs and the next person comes up. Well, this this duo came up, one played lead, and one played fill, and I'm listening to him, and he played all the fills that I had played on these two songs. And so afterwards, he came down, he said, here, he said, I had all your fills transcribed, and he gave me a souvenir of, of, the, 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 of the transcription, you know, uh -huh. on paper of all the fills. So they're all there, just listen and pick them out, you know. Gosh, I don't know how many albums Frank and I did together, and then all the albums I did with the uh, with Canada's folk, he came Walter Austin. I got played so many albums, at least 50 albums with him, probably 50 albums with Frank. So all of it's there. Just, just take it easy. First thing you have to know are your chords. want to get when you're playing fill you always want to land on the proper note and try to make a little melody if i was playing a melody or, or just a song of fills it would be maybe like this so that's just something i just got off the top of my head but you can see it sort of lends itself to a melody, your fills go somewhere. They, you just can't put a random fill in. It has to take it from point A to point B. You know, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about really in terms of like, you know, how you got to where you are, not just with technique and stuff or your, or your, your ear um, or how to play with people, I think really, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, sounds like it's all about listening, you know? It's all oh, about yeah. being Completely. aware. Completely. Completely. You know, and not just um, listening and, and active listening too. not just listening as like a like, you know, like you would if you're in the shower or something, listening to some music or driving in the car, but not that you can't be actively listening. But when you're when you're really focused on finding like what is what is the truth behind what you're hearing, you know, like I what, said before, listen, listen to Madhavani and, and really pay attention to what the violins are doing. You know, or listen to a brass band and listen, listen to what the horns are doing. Just specifically listen to that. Um, th that's the way to do it. Uh, you know, it, you, a lot of people just listen to the whole thing. Although that's, that's not bad if they're listening in the right way. Because a, a good producer or a good band member listens to the whole sound of the band so nobody steps on anybody's toes. You know, uh, when a singer is singing, you don't want to be playing over him. You want to give him space to sing. Uh, and when it's your turn, you want to make sure that you're covering the whole spectrum of, of what should be played and not leave a, a lot of holes or empty space. So listen to records. It's all out there. Everything that's, you know, uh, you're not going to do anything that hasn't been done before. Nobody has. There's only 12 notes. But listen to what's been done before you and then try to make it your own, you know? Absolutely. I think that's... Um really where it, ha where it has to start, you know. I, um, I hear some students who are just trying to play things like whether it's jazz or whether it's polka or, or western swing or gypsy jazz, and they're looking for answers um, like in a book or, or something written down or a theory or something. 
And, um, you know, the number one thing that I have all my students, you know, they bring in a, a tune and, and they'll say, I want to learn to play Autumn Leaves. And I okay, well, what's your favorite recording of Autumn Leaves? And they go, oh, I don't know. And you're like, well, that's the first place to start, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have somebody that in mind when you're starting a tune like that, um, you know, I think that's so important because it gives you, it gives you that anchor, you know, it gives that ear, um, something for you to kind of base what you're learning off of and make your own thing. Sure. And that's, that's also why I say work with other musicians in the band that are, that are really great because you'll hear something a guitar player does that you really like, you know, and remember what that is. And if you're taking a break or I used to do it when I would go home, I would listen to what he did and I would quickly try to, and then I try to implement that and, and work it out all the different keys. Another thing that's really great is to, is to know the feel of the instrument, which I'm sort of lacking now because I can, but, but when you're playing. We can play all the no matter what, what, what key you're in, so you can feel it and, and know without thinking about uh, scales. You know, your hand just knows you. If, if the song is in uh, B flat, you know, how to play in B flat. You know, if you're playing in G, same thing. I'm not thinking about scales or anything. I just am familiar with the key uh, that I'm playing in. You know, it's a, uh, I, I don't know really how to explain it. And I don't know that there's any books that will tell you that, but it's just practicing. You know, people would tell me, man, you know, you're a natural. Well, when I was starting to take it seriously, I would practice for for like four hours a day. I, mean, I would just do it. It wasn't, it was, and it wasn't just playing the same song so, till I got it right. It was playing the song until I'd never get it wrong. That's, that's a good thing too. You know, I played it until I'd never get it wrong, not until I just got it right. Because it, you can play it and get it right one time and then the next time you play it, it's going to be wrong, you know. So, right, well, yeah, don't stop when you get that. One, one out of a hundred is not enough, you that's know. That's right. That's right. No. Yeah. People can get a little bit, I have students like that too, who are, you know, they're practicing and they're practicing and then they hit it once and they go, great, and they're ready to move on. You know, it's kind of like, no, man, just hang out on that now until you feel like you don't even have to think anymore. And it's, it's sure. totally. That's it. That's the key. So you don't have to think anymore. That, you hit the nail on the head. That's what I've been trying to say. So you don't have to think. It's just an expression. Just like when you're singing, you don't think about what you're singing. You just do it. You know, it's, it's a. Uh, what you feel and how you how you hear it in your in your soul, whatever. Absolutely. Um, I have a question from Deborah Peters. I know uh, Deborah Peters. She's great. She's keeping the accordions going in Texas like nobody's business. She's wonderful. And she asked, um, she asked, how you know? Do you play umpa polka rhythms over chords when you're not soloing? But also, how best can we keep ourselves from not playing too much uh, rhythm during other solos, but still be supportive to other players at the same time? Well, I don't do Oompa. If, uh, if she's talking about Riders in the Sky, I don't. I'll, I'll play just like a horn section. You know, like if Woody's taking a thing like, a, oh, what's the song that he would play? Uh, uh, how High the Moon? <laughs> Stings behind them, but why? Well, what I would never do would be this. <laughs> It's basically what I'm doing. And if, if he's singing uh, a ballad, uh, right now the canyon, for example, uh, you get a da and you have to watch what he's doing. If he's going to play over those uh, the, uh, the turnarounds, you have to not get in his way. So if he was playing a but 
but if nothing's happening, and, and that, that's what a band is, you get to know what the other guy's going to do. So Woody and I read each other very, very well, you know, and uh, so there's no dead air, but there's not this, you know, conglomeration of a zillion notes played that don't make any sense. So, really talking about but listening. Deborah, yeah. But Deborah does it great. Deborah's got a great band down there, and uh, she's she's wonderful. She's a great teacher. She has a great uh, method. She get, has a lot of uh, DVDs and things, and uh, she's a good girl. I notice on your left hand, you know, you tend to play really light as well, which I think is one thing that many accordion players have a, have a tendency to, number one, not keep their left hand consistent, like it'll be boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, ba, boom, chick, boom, you know, whether, whether it's because they're changing chords or they're maybe holding something in the right hand and so they're mirroring, but you have this great, really light touch, and it's something that I've been um, talking a lot with, with Dallas about, too. And it's this um, idea that, you know, if you have enough compression in your bellows and you're pulling well, that you don't actually have to push the, the button down all the way. You can be very light. And then you, right. don't, get this, you don't get this sort of uh, overpowering left hand because the left hand of the accordion can be really, really, it can be really strong. And, you know, um, what do you do to kind of maintain that? Are you thinking about just touching lightly? Are you trying to press down oh. halfway, practice that nope. way? It, it just, after playing one way so long, for example, I, I have a, one of my pans uh, has been retrofitted with a, with a MIDI system. And uh, I had to work with, with the fellow who installed it to make sure that the basses were just feather light. I don't, I don't like to play it. Unless, unless I need it. set of bagpipes. I, I always love this. He always said, bagpipes are an ill wind that ne'er blows well. Right? And I equated that to persons, people who play accordion basses really, really legato and loud. Just take so much away from your right hand. You have to work the bellows to where it, it you know. It's, uh, and, and in a band, I wouldn't be doing that. I would only do that because I'm playing a solo. But, you know. extension a lot of times when I'm playing six six finger chords which you know you, you can do Excellent. You, you know, don't, don't just grab a C bass because you're in the key of C. I mean, you know, this is part of, of the instrument. It's not just something that you're doing this with while you're playing the right hand. It's just as important as this if, in certain places. You just don't want to overdo it, you know. Sure. You know, we talked a lot about um, about your, you know, your arranging and, and creating music for, for stuff. Do you, um, do you write? original stuff? I mean, not just arrangements, but do you have, you know, your own things that you play? Would sure. you be able oh, yeah. to do those? Uh, well, uh, most of the stuff that I do that's original, uh, well, yeah, here's one that we did as writers.
Yeah. There's some other stuff, but yeah, there's a lot, and, and especially for the work that I do for Disney and Pixar, um, they'll give me. I think in this latest project, there are like four or five songs that that Slim and I wrote, a couple that I wrote by myself. Uh, that'll be used to uh, the Disney theme parks. Uh, I go to Shanghai, China, in November, and uh, I'll do a recording session there. So a lot of things I do are very interesting. I'll once the songs. Are written, which they are. I'll record them with a band here in Nashville uh, in August and then put the vocals on, which will later be taken off because I'll take the tracks to Shanghai and get Chinese singers to sing them in Mandarin. So I'm working with, yeah, I'm working with a translator on this whole thing to make sure that a lot of the, the lyrics that I use in English uh, are easily translated into Mandarin because it can't be a literal translation. It has to take the whole story and then and then translate it. And it's, it's very exciting, very cool. You know, I, I just I do a lot of stuff like that. It's very fun. Very much. That fun. sounds super fun. How's the yeah. food out there, Shanghai? <laughs> you know what? I had I must say back in 1968, I had the world's work. Well, for me, it was the worst Chinese food I ever had in Hong Kong. I probably didn't know what to order, but I didn't like it at all. On, on, conversely, I was in uh, Salzburg, Austria, and uh, I went to the Mozartium and uh, listened to a symphony done in the instruments of Mozart's time, and there was a Chinese restaurant there, and I thought, you know what? How many guys will go to Austria and go to a Chinese restaurant and order some? I went in, and they came, they had the same accents as the Chinese people here at the Chinese restaurants, you know? It was exactly the same thing. They couldn't understand English about as much as they can here. And the food was terrific. It was unbelievable. I can't believe it. So in Hong Kong, it was not good. It was great in Austria. So we'll see how it is in, in, uh, in uh, Shanghai. <laughs> Excellent, man. Well, Joey, um, we're getting close. It's about, about an hour and a half. I know you got things to do and, and places to be. You want to play the uh, – I was hoping you played the – I was hoping you'd play the, uh, the the exiting song from The Riders in the Sky. <laughs> which one? Home of the Range or which one? So long, saddle oh. pal. <laughs> session I did with the writers before I became a member of course uh, was the album on MCA called Writers Radio Theater and Woody being as peculiar as he is sometimes and you know Woody Paul has a doctorate in theoretical plasma physics from MIT. True. Heard so, it. I've so heard it on the radio. I assume we so. Always, we always say he can tell you how the sun works but he has no idea what day it is. So, <laughs> so anyway it comes time and I'm sitting there I I I just met the writers. How are you doing? How's it going? You know. So anyway, it comes recorders comes over and said, "Well," and he said, the, "This is a the theme song from Writers Radio Theater. It's an A, but you know how it goes." I'm like, "What are you talking about? I never heard it." <laughs> but what do you assume everybody had heard it? But anyway, yeah, I'm going to play the end of it. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Joey. It's been such a pleasure to, to talk with you and to hear you play. And, um, and I'll be posting this uh, video on YouTube uh, for the rest of our members to, to check, check out their leisure. And um, good luck with all your projects. And I hope to keep in touch and hopefully we can get a chance to, to play together too, soon. I do too. I really hope so. And, you know, to all the accordion players, just keep it up. Have fun with it. It's, it's fun. You know, my great friend, the guy who brought me to Nashville, Jack Clement, used to say, we're in the fun business. And if we're not having fun, we're not doing our jobs. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys, I think we're ready to sign off. So thank you so much, Joey. It was thank a you. pleasure, pleasure. And, I, and I'm sure we'll hear from you again soon. Great. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Dave. Goodbye, Dale. Everybody. Next, see you next time.